All right. Hello, class. Well, welcome to the final lecture in this series, 7 through 11, on optimal control. So we started this series by defining system norms, specifically H2 and uh, the uh, H-infinity norm. And up till now, we've been focusing on the H-infinity norm uh, because it has some very nice, uh, real, practical, physical interpretations. Um, now both of these norms are transfer function norms. So they're, they measure the size of the transfer function, in some sense. Um, and, you know, there's a question, right? Is measuring the size of the transfer function actually helpful in any sense, right? Because really we're interested in physical properties, or properties of the system. And the transfer function, well, it represents the system. The size of that representation, does that even matter? Well, in the H-infinity case, we had a strong correlation between that norm and the system properties. The H2 norm is more problematic. Remember the H2 norm is, this is the H2 norm. H2 norm is the integral of uh, essentially the uh, the size of the transfer function integrated over the imaginary axis. Right. So what would that represent? Well, we've been arguing so far that it doesn't represent much. Uh, in this lecture, however, we'll show that it does represent something. Uh, there's two things which can be used to represent, and three things if you count uh, the Kalman filter at the end. Um, and so, you know, the, the previous lectures were sort of meat and potatoes, right? We, eating your broccoli kind of stuff. Uh, we had to get, we went into the, into the weeds a little bit, and uh, now we're going to come out of the little weeds and take a bigger picture look at, uh, at what this represents, because synthesis in the H2 norm uh, it's actually not that much harder than synthesis in the H-infinity norm. In, in some ways, it's, it's even easier. Uh, so we'll go through and we'll, we'll solve the optimal control problem in the H2 norm. Uh, but I emphasize not in this lecture, not the, uh, any proofs or derivations, because they're more or less the same as for the H-infinity norm, but interpretations. So we'll go through at least three interpretations of the H2 norm and what it means and how it can be used. In particular, we'll focus on its relationship. Well, we're not going to talk about LQG too much, uh, but LQR and Kalman filtering at the end. Right. So, uh, so let's get started. <clears throat> right. So, uh, remember our H infinity norm um, so solution. So we'll, we'll we'll come back to this at the end and do dynamic output feedback in the H two norm. Uh, but just to remember, right, we had two changes of variables. Uh, to get to this LMI, right? Uh, so we had to change once to get from AKB, KC, K, DK to AK2, BK2, CK2, and DK2. And then we had to change again to get to AN, BN, CN, DN. And we also had a half dual transformation. So several steps have taken place to get to this LMI. And the question, of course, is going to become, are these steps still going to be valid when we're looking at the H2 norm, which has a different set of LMIs, which define it? And can these steps be used again? And we'll find out that they can, uh, and, and, but we'll bring, come back to that. At, well, in lecture B, we'll do state feedback, and then in lecture C, or part C, we'll cover uh, the dynamic output feedback case. <clears throat> so just to remember, just recalling uh, what these uh, variable transformations are, uh, A N, B N, C N, D N are the variables from the LMI. We use that to get this sort of auxiliary set of control variables, AK2, BK2, CK2, and DK2, and then we use those to reconstruct AK, BK, CK, and DK. And uh, there's uh, this question of uh, X2. We have to choose an X2. It's not uniquely defined. We have to check invertibility, yada, yada, yada. Right. So we'll be applying those same techniques to H2. So this is just a reminder of what they are. You can flip back to the slide if you like. <clears throat> In the end, though, we get a system, closed-loop system, uh, or a, a, a controller, full-order full controller, 
AK is the same size as A, which defines the system, and then we have these other matrices, BK, CK, and DK. It's not unique, uh, but in the end, it gives you an H infinity norm, which has this nice physical interpretation in terms of uh, minimum energy gain. That minimizes the energy gain from the size of the input in the L2 norm to the size of the output in the L2 norm. Now, is there, if we were to change this to H2, is there a similar interpretation? Is there some other interpretation we can use? That's the question. So, we have to look fairly hard to find such an interpretation. And in particular, uh, now, uh, we have to really look in the frequency domain to find this interpretation. So we're going to have our, our plant here uh, coupled with a controller, two inputs, two outputs, let's keep it that way. Exogenous input W, regulated output Z. Right. So in the H infinity case, we, uh, we had a W is a function of L2, square integrable time domain functions. In the H2 norm, however, we have to sort of abandon that viewpoint. We're going to have to uh, think of the input signal in the frequency domain. And what's more, we have to do a little bit more work. We have to assume that our input is not L2. Right, so it, it's not not in L2 square integrable. Uh, furthermore, it's not even H2, uh, so that's squ square integral in the frequency domain. Uh, and in fact, we have to go a little bit further and assume it's uh, it's it's white noise. Um, well, it doesn't have to be white noise, but let's assume it's noise, uh, and we'll we'll talk about what white or not in in a minute. Uh, so. In particular, so here's a, you remember the H2 norm of the transfer function. That's, that's what it is. It's the square integral along the imaginary axis. And now imagine that our input, our external input, is noise. Gaussian noise, so has a, a frequency component. And it has a, a power spectral density, which sort of uh, gives sort of the integral of the frequency components um, along the, uh, the imaginary axis. So if we take the expectation of that W2, right? So the expected size of that, uh, of that uh, uh, time domain signal over, uh, over time, uh, then we find that this, uh, well, I mean, this is sort of the definition of power spectral density, uh, that, that this is the integral of the frequency components of that noise over the imaginary axis. So this power spectral density is, uh, first of all, it's a positive matrix, I omega, uh, along, for every value on the imaginary axis, it's a positive matrix. Um, and, uh, and so, right, it, it has to be square integrable in a, a certain sense, which, as we'll see, is, is a little bit problematic. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, so why is this helpful, right? So we have now an input, W, uh, with a power spectral density s hat i omega, where we have a little w to indicate it's associated with w. Um, so the uh, so how does this how does this help us? Well, it helps us because uh, there's this nice result. I mean, uh, you could actually it's relatively easy to show uh, that if you have a linear time invariant system, if you think about this in the transfer function sense. Um, so if you here, I'm going to go left to right for a second. If you have a uh, a linear system, a transfer function p hat of s, input w, output z, and if w has power spectral density uh, s hat w of i omega, then the output of this linear time invariant system uh, will also be noise. First of all, right? Also noise. Uh, and furthermore, uh, that noise has a particular spectral density, uh, which can be found by multiplying the original spectral density, so that's a W, on the left and the right by that transfer function. So that the power spectral density of Z is P hat of I omega. Uh, 
sorry, I'm making a mistake there. S hat of i omega sub w and p hat i omega. So the uh, power spectral density of the input signal gets modified uh, somewhat counterintuitively, I guess, but remember these have to be positive matrices. So they're, I mean, I guess it makes some sense. Uh, by multiplying, oh, forgot the star. These are complex valued functions, of course, so we have to use stars as opposed to transposes. By multiplying on the left and the right uh, by uh, the transfer function p hat. So uh, if, uh, if, 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 if this term is positive definite, right? This term will also be, well, at least positive semi-definite, uh, presumably positive definite as well, because these don't go to zero. And, uh, and so we can get some estimate of the variance of the output signal, z, in time, or in frequency domain, if we want to stay strictly in frequency domain, uh, using this, uh, the transfer function, right? And the fact that we're using the transfer function is important, right? Because, of course, right, it's a property of the transfer function, and we're, of course, limiting that norm, the integral of that transfer function. That, that's, that's the H2 norm. <clears throat> All right, so let's uh, take it a step further. All right. Uh, and so let's examine this variance of the, uh, the output, Z. <clears throat> All right. And, uh, well, what is the... Uh, that's the... Uh, so here we have... We've switched letters here a little bit, so now we have G. We're going to go left to right down. W output Z in the frequency domain. Um, <clears throat> remember, this has a variance uh, uh, S W of I omega, G at of I omega, star G of I omega. And uh, so if we look at the variance now of the output, uh, given the input, well, we can bound the uh, we can bound this integral, right? <clears throat> we can bound this uh, this integral by uh, by noticing that uh, this term here uh, is just if we if we take just the maximum value of this uh, s i omega um, overall frequencies, right? So uh, this is uh, s of i omega uh, that uh, that norm. <clears throat> is less than or equal to uh, the, uh, the h infinity norm of s hat of i omega, h infinity, right? Because that, that, that's what the h infinity norm is. It's just the maximum value of s hat of i omega over the, free, over the imaginary axis, right? So we can just, uh, we can bound that and pull it out, right, as the h infinity norm. Sorry, we're using the h infinity norm, not the h2 norm. That's, uh, I guess we have some mixed norms here, so it's problematic. But then the rest of this bit becomes the, uh, the integral of g hat, right? So I have a little hat there, right? So that the, uh, the variance then of the output is bounded by the h2 norm of the system uh, times the, uh, the h infinity norm, of course, of the, uh, the signal itself. So if that's w, right, we can make that w there. Um, so... Uh, so then it's kind of clear, I guess, if you minimize the h2 norm of the transfer function, right, and that's our transfer function norm, uh, then you're going to be minimizing, in some sense, the, uh, the variance of, the, uh, of the, uh, the output. Now, right, this, this approximation of s with the h infinity norm is, is kind of problematic, right, because obviously it's not uniform overall frequencies, unless, of course, this white noise. And here we cut to white noise. So in general, if it's colored noise, right, this will be, uh, this bound will not be accurate for certain frequencies. For colored noise. But it's exact for white noise. Because for white noise, the uh, power spectral density is unitary. It has frequency components at all uh, all uh, equal magnitude frequency components at all frequencies. Right? <clears throat> and so we can say then that the H2 norm, we can give sort of an exact characterization in a limited sense, that the H2 norm of a system it gives the, precisely the variance of the output 
of that system when exposed to white noise. So the H2 norm, H2 norm is a variance of the output, Z regulated output, when the input is white noise. Right. So that's uh, that's uh, that, that's a, that's a reasonable interpretation of the H two norm. Um, of course, in reality, noise is, is rarely white. Right. White noise is an extreme case. Right. Because it says that all components of the frequency are exactly the same, even the really high ones. So even the really high, there's there's some like component of the frequency which is getting really fast. Uh, and that's uh, equal in magnitude to the to say 60 hertz, right? Which is going, you know, like that. So white noise is not something we actually see in reality. It's more of a mathematical convenience, unfortunately. Right. So, <clears throat> you know, our conclusion then at this point is that uh, H2 optimal control. If we solve the H2 optimal control problem, well, that would be optimal for suppressing white noise when the input is expected to be white noise. Unfortunately, of course, this doesn't work or it's, it's extremely inaccurate when the noise is actually not white. It's, it's colored. It has uh, some components. Uh, typically, our colored noise would look like that, right? It has some frequency component and uh, it sort of tails off at the high, high end of the frequency spectrum. So can we extend the H2 norm to cover the more reasonable case when the noise is colored? Well, it turns out uh, we can do that. Right? We can do that. So if you have a um, estimate of the spectral content of your noise, well, we can, uh, we can modify our optimal control problems uh, using pre-filters to uh, essentially obtain a pseudo system which minimizes the effect of white noise, but in reality uh, minimizes the uh, response of the system to colored noise uh, on the output. Right? So that's, that's what we're going to do on the next slide, which is relatively complex. Right? So basically, let's see, let's look at this, uh, let's draw a picture. Right? So uh, should we go light, right to left or left to right? Uh, I think we're going I'm more comfortable now going right to left, I think, at this point. So, okay, so here's our, int uh, our control problem right there. Here's our colored noise here, W. And here is our um, output, Z. And here's, of course, Y, and this is U, and this is, uh, we're using P, uh, and this is uh, um, K. So yeah, we can even go further. We can use a four system representation, P11, P12, P21, P22. Yeah. So what's, uh, what's, uh, what are we gonna do, All right? So this is colored noise, right? And we don't know how to control for colored noise, right? We don't know how to do that. But the, uh, the, the key thing to note, right, is that uh, how do you get colored noise? Well, you start with white noise and you color it. Right. So, um, OK, so if we wanted to, uh, to, to to predict the response or minimize the response to, to colored noise. Right. Uh, well, what should we should really do. Right. So how do we get colored noise? Right. So we uh, you take white noise, uh, U. And we uh, we filter it through some um, subsystem we'll call H and we get. Uh, colored noise. We get the colored noise out. So essentially we can rewrite this diagram a little bit as in this way. Uh, we made that W. Could put a pre-filter there, H and uh, U, right? So that we are in this case how we have a system where uh, the input is white noise and the output is Z, right? So, okay, very good. Uh, first of all, how do we get H, right? 
So remember that the response of a linear time invariant system to white noise, uh, or any kind of noise really, is to multiply on the left and the right by the transfer function, right? So if uh, the input is u, uh, and that, that, that signal is white noise, identity, uh, then the output of that system will be h of i omega uh, s, h of i omega star, and of course this is just the identity. And so if we desire a, um, a, a, a noise with power spectral density s of i omega, remember this is a positive matrix, uh, we just take the square root of that positive matrix along the frequency domain or, uh, for every frequency and, uh, and we choose that as our h, uh, so there h is the square root of, of s, and, uh, and then the output of that system is right, the power spectral density of the white noise, or uh, sorry, the colored noise. So our first step is we can do this, right? We can, we can construct an equivalent system whose input is white noise and whose output is still or the same desired S, right? So the only trick here, right, is then to, this is not our, right, not our, 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 our optimal control framework. This is not the framework we, we talked about in lecture eight. Uh, and so we have to we have to modify this slightly, right? So that our input is white noise and our output is z. And so all we do then, right, is we uh, we uh, we expand p a little bit, right? So that uh, before we, we we put a little a larger block here, right? Uh, this mini block here, which is p11, p12, p21, p22. Our input is uh, u, right? And then we have a filter h. And then that goes into P. And so this signal, which is an internal signal, is the colored noise. And this pseudo signal, sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, fictitious signal, uh, is white noise. And then we, uh, we connect all the, the lines as we would normally. Right? Z, and there I have a controller down here, K. Right? So, okay, so what's the effect of this? Well, uh, remember what these subsystems represent, right? They, both of these uh, talk about the map from um, the, uh, so P11, P21, uh, talk about the map from uh, the, uh, oh, well, sorry, there's like, uh, I've re overused U, really, but oh well, I think I, I, am I too far into it to call it something else? Let's call it V. V. All right, so that's U, that's V. Okay, so uh, the uh, these two subsystems here, P11 and P21, uh, map V to Z1, and they map it to, 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 to Y as well, of course. And so, right, we can uh, reduce this block diagram, we can simplify this block diagram here uh, to, uh, to a four-system representation just by pre-multiplying these, uh, these subsystems, P11 and P21, by this H. Right? And so we get, uh, I guess, a third uh, system, but I'm running out of room here. I don't know where to put it. Uh, so we'll move that block over here, create a little new block. And that's just P11 times H, uh, P21 times H, P12, P22. Because, of course, these, the inputs to these two subsystems are the uh, are u which which isn't filtered right so it's only it only filters these two bits okay. uh, so that's that's that block there we've just reduced it a bit so now we have an optimal control problem whose input is white noise and whose output is z right and so now we do our we saw we we, we close the loop on this uh on this uh um this uh, uh, altered, enlarged, I don't know, pre-filtered uh, uh, control system, do the LFT on it, right? And we, what is the LFT, right? Here we're in the four system representation, so this is the LFT, linear fractional transformation. Uh, and we just substitute in, right, that H, so it pops in there, right, pops in there. Those are the only two places it shows up. And so what we get is that the 
LFT, somewhat to be expected, I suppose, uh, of the uh, of the enlarged plant, the new plant, uh, or new, new, new closed loop system, is just the LFT of the old closed loop system uh, with a multi or H multiplied in front of it. Right? So there's our H, H, H. We just factor out that H. And because, right, these are, uh, this is a linear algebra, or this is an algebra, we can, uh, we can do this, right? Because these, they, we have the math, proper mathematical machinery to make this happen. Right. So, uh, okay, so what, uh, what does this do, right? Um, so if we now find, if we now design our, our, our controller to minimize the H2 norm of, the, of this artificial plant, right? Then, right? What is the what is the uh, what is the uh, the spectral density of the output? Well, the spectral density of the output, right, is equal to um, well uh, is equal to right the uh, spectral density uh, or, or sorry the h I guess the uh, it's equal to the transfer function of the uh, of this augmented system. Right, that's uh, subject. Uh, so because we're we're subjecting it to white noise, it's equal to that uh, uh, the the square of the that transfer function, right? And if we just uh, we we simplify that, we we use this identity here, right? Then the uh, we we pull out the h here, right here, and uh, and we find then that the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Original plant, right? The original plant, um, the response of the uh, uh, of this plant to uh, uh, the variance of the output is equal to uh, the response of the original plant to the colored noise, which is equal to the response of the augmented system to white noise. So that implies that if we design our controller to minimize the H2 norm of this filtered plant, right? This will actually have the effect of minimizing the variance of the output uh, to the original plant when subjected to the colored noise. So if you, if you, if you got all that. Um, so I think I uh, can also explain it here, right? Uh, so for example, right, if, we, if we're looking at solving this optimal control problem, right, this is the one we want to solve, where we're choosing k to minimize the uh, size of the variance of the actual system, right? The actual response of this actual system to colored noise, right? To colored noise. Uh, well, that's equal to, right? The um, variance, uh, it's equal to the control problem we're finding k to minimize the uh, variance of the original system pre-filtered by H uh, response to white noise, right? So that those two problems are equivalent. And uh, furthermore, right, uh, we, we, we find that, right, this, um, uh, the, this variance, right, by, the, uh, by, by the, the definition, right, is equal to the H2 norm of this, uh, of this, uh, 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 this augmented system, this pre-filtered system, which of course, and we can do one, go, go one, we should go one thing further, which is equal to the min of the H2 norm of this augmented system, what are we calling it? Uh, P, S, comma, K. Right. Right. So if we solve the optimal control problem where we're minimizing the H2 norm of the closed loop system uh, using the pre-filtered subsystem, so there's the pre-filtered here. Uh, well, that's going to also minimize the uh, response of the actual system to uh, colored noise. Right? So in that sense, right, the only thing we need to modify when we add colored noise is we just need to change our uh, optimal control framework by adding a little subsystem in front of the uh, the actual system and solve that. So mathematically, that's not an actual system, right? But mathematically, that gives us uh, the that the, res the response that we're looking for. Right. 
So again, it is a fairly complicated way of explaining something which is relatively simple, which is you just put H in front of your your your, your problem, and that's going to going to allow you to, to deal with colored noise. So um, right, so how do we do this? How do we solve this problem? Right. So in the in lecture uh, seven, right, we gave an LMI for the H two norm of a system, right, P for matrix representation, we can do that, A, B, C, D, right? Uh, so we can find a LM, an LMI, for which, which gives us the H2 norm of that system by essentially searching for either the controllability or the observability Gramian. Now, Actually, in this case, the controllability Gramian is not a solution to this. In the original LMI in lecture seven, it was a solution. I've altered the LMI slightly here because uh, for, for reasons which we'll, we'll see in a second. So in lecture seven, I gave a slightly different LMI, which uh, gave the observability, the controllability Gramian. Uh, here I'm giving a slightly different one, which gives the uh, the control the uh, so I, I gave the controllability Gramian and now I'm giving one for the observability Gramian. Right. So this is an LMI uh, with variable x, right? Two inequalities here, uh, one on this trace and one uh, here. Right. So I'm actually and this this seems going to seem very pedantic in lecture A, but we're going to come back and use it in lecture B. I'm actually going to go very briefly through this proof again. It's not the same proof because, of course, it's not just a tiny little modification. Uh, but it's essentially the same proof, but this time for the observability Gramian, uh, because, as we'll see, uh, that, that's, that's what we want um, in this case. So I'll, I'll just go through it real quickly. Uh, so remember what the observability Gramian was, right? It's this, uh, this integral. Uh, here, remember the controllability Gramian, it was B, B transpose in the middle, right? But now we're using C. Uh, and of course, the key to this was that uh, the Laplace transform, uh, the key to this proof was that the Laplace transform of E to the AT is uh, equal to the, uh, the inner part of the transfer function, uh, SI minus A. So the transfer function, right, of the system, uh, are we using P? Yeah, we're using P hat. So that's the transfer function of the system, right? And so the transfer function of the system is actually um, equal to the Laplace transform of the time domain signal given by C A to the A T B. Uh, and so that's an important thing which we're going to use when we relate the H2 problem to LQR, right? So it allows us to get something about the size of the transfer function uh, in terms of the size of this signal, and this signal is useful for LQR. Right. So, the, so the size of the transfer function will be related to the size of this function here, which right now doesn't have a whole lot of physical interpretation, but except in terms of the Gramian. Right? And so its interpretation of the Gramian, if we look at the H2 norm of a, that system, right? Uh, well, remember what that is. That's the, uh, the integral of the transfer functions, the, so, the square integral of the transfer function along the imaginary axis. So that's the square integral. Uh, by Parseval's uh, inequality, right? or equality, actually, uh, it's actually equal to and that's sort of that, you know, remember the norms in the L2 uh, space and norms in the H2 space are the same. Right. Oops. Right. So that the H2 norm of uh, the uh, the transfer function 
is equal to the L2 norm of that signal, right? Which is fairly obvious. Uh, but then, of course, uh, we, we take, took it one step further where we move the integral inside and notice that that part of the integral is just the observability Gramian. And so that the H2 norm is the trace of B transpose observability Gramian B. Right. And uh, the there was actually a, a second part to this proof showing it satisfies the other LMI, but I'm going to skip that because this was the important part. Uh, that the there's a relationship between the psi, the L2 norm of this thing here, and the H2 norm of uh, the transfer function C S I minus A inverse B. Notice we don't have a D here. Right. And that showed up here, right, as well. There's no D. Right. There's no D for a very important reason. Uh, that if you integrate uh, from zero to infinity, right, of plus d, of a d, transpose d, right, right, that's an infinite, that's infinite, right. So this, uh, so the H2 norm does not allow for d matrices, right, so uh, that, that's, that's definitely the limitation. We're, we're assuming that d has to be zero here. Right. Anyway, so the rest of the proof we can skip. Uh, and actually, so I believe that um, concludes uh, the, the first part of this lecture where we talk about interpretations of the H2 norm. And we'll come back very quickly now in this part B and, uh, and show that we can solve the H2 uh, optimal control problem, uh, at least from the state feedback sense, and we'll relate it to, uh, to LQR as well. Um, and using that identity, which I just showed, on the previous slide that the norm of e to the at b l2 norm is equal to the uh, the h2 norm of the transfer function right. so i'll just pause here let everyone take a break and come back uh, in a minute